All right, welcome back to the next edition of the Cauliflower Alley Club Shadow Fire Promotions podcast, front row ringside. My my guest at this time, if you could please come out here, I have the Stro, formerly known as the Maestro, a competitor in our distinguished competition over at World Championship Wrestling. Stro, how are you today? Doing wonderful. Thanks for having me. Uh, you're very welcome. Uh, no, no more mean gene. Uh, he's not here anymore, right? <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to check. But my might get in trouble. So, uh, so how many years you've been coming to the Kelly Fire Alley Club? Oh, well, you're doing great. You know, it's it's like one of my favorite wrestling events to go every year. Uh, so much history. It's like an encyclopedia of the wrestling business. And and seeing my peers, seeing mentors, and seeing people I know in the business, in the wrestling family that come together like this. It's a beautiful thing. How many years you've been coming? Uh, this will be actually my second year. And my so, second year too. So it, it, it's, it's awesome, man. I'm having a great time, you know what I mean? I've, uh, you know, it's, it's always a great thing. You see a lot of guys, a lot of different years, and like you said, it's a virtual encyclopedia from the territories to the national promotions and, you know, all over, independent federations of today, you know, everything. It's, it's great, you know, not only, you know, people that I, I know and I grew up on, but like people that do my grand uncle years ago that it, it, they hear the stories they tell and everything, you know, with uh, Gorgeous George and all that, it's, uh, it, this is an amazing time every year, it really is. And this year is even better than last year, so it, it, They, they always try wonderful. to top it, they always try to top it. Yes. Now, you know, we're going to go and, and we were going to start off with, uh, you know, how long you've been involved, but since you brought up your grand uncle, let's talk a little bit about him. How well did you know him growing up, and how much did you understand about what he did? And then, for those that don't know, please tell us more about who he is. How they might do all that. Well, he was my grand uncle, and my grandfather and him were amateur boxing buddies back in the day, you know, before he broke into business. And it's like, I didn't find this up later on in my life, you know, because it, it, it's, life is so ironic, you know. I mean, before I, even, I knew my relationship to <laughs> My grand uncle, I, I had this deep love for wrestling, deep love for professional wrestling. Um, I, I was in theater, at, athletics, academics, um, anything you can think of, but wrestling's always been my passion. And then later on in my life, I had guys like uh, William Regal, Dustin Rhodes, Rich Flair, comparing my style to the original George, George, which you know, I find out through my grand uncle that you know, I am of relation. <laughs> the stories be told and meet people later, you know, that he influenced, you know, the Muhammad Ali's, the James Browns, the in people in the entertainment industry that were influenced by him. Uh, it, it was just amazing. And, and to, at that point in my career time where I represented the great name, the family name, Gordon George, was a big honor and thrill. Now, let me two things. Uh, first off, your relationship with Gordon George, there's a lot of people that go around and business. I'm, you know, X name Junior or whatever. You really are related to Gordon George. This isn't a gimmick. This isn't no, some sort oh, of... Absolutely. You know, I want to put that out there because a lot of guys are like, well, I go under the name of, you know, Ric Flair the Third. You know, it's like, he didn't have any kids. Uh, well, it's just, you know, eh, it's a gimmick I use, just, you know. Uh, and then also, you know, since you brought up the, the notion of what Gorgeous George did and what he meant to this business in terms of the showmanship that he brought and how his influence was felt along the way. You know, did you, when, when you, you know, obviously you can read newspaper clippings and see old reels, there, there's plenty of stuff, you know, Vern Gagne uh, and a lot of the old AWA tapes talks about Gorgeous George, he's got that story, get your filthy hands off of me. <laughs> and everything, and, and oh, wow. you know, when you see all that stuff, you just get a chuckle out of it, and you're like, man, that's so cool if my granduncle, you know, has done all that, and what, what an influence he was. It, it, just, just even thinking about what he's done for the business, and, and hearing the stories, I just get goosebumps here. I mean, just talking to you, just now, thinking about it. Just the other day, matter of fact, I got a, a, a portrait from uh, Alias the Champ, the movie, with, and it had his picture with it along, like, one of the actors in the film, and it, it, it's just... I, I, it's uncanny. I mean, even look in the mirror, you know, the resemblance, you know, that him and I have is it's crazy. And, you know, I, I, I'll, it, it's just, it's such a, a huge honor, you know, knowing that you're related to one of the greatest of all time. It really is. With that, I mean, a lot of people throw on the term, oh, the greatest, a legend. You know, I personally don't like to do that unless you actually are a legend. And in, in this 
the way I do it is I can change it with that capital L because certainly Gordon George is no doubt a legend. His influence has fell from Jesse Ventura to Hulk Hogan to, you know, to Ric Flair. You know, Ric doesn't have quite the same style, but, you know, with the, the big robes and the elegance and everything, and Randy Savage with the theme music and everything. Right, right. You know, when you think about how many people, you know, here's someone who's, whose time in wrestling was in the 50s, He's influencing people to this day, yes. whether it be directly or indirectly. And what I mean by indirectly is like third hand. You've got a guy, okay, I'm going to do a Ric Flair thing. Mm-hmm. Well, who was Ric Flair influenced by? So, right. you know, when, when you do you ever stop to think about that and, and, and your place in wrestling and say, you know, damn, I'm just, you know, to, to, it's, it's mind-boggling to sit there and say, wow, you know, this is, this is my place, this is wrestling. Uh, you know, the, every time I think about it, I, I'm just in awe. You know, and, and if I can do a fraction of what he did, or, or doing to make him proud up in heaven, you know, I mean, I'm just, uh, I'd, I'd be happy because I mean, I, I want to do my part just like he did back in the day to be the innovator and the pioneer like that he was. I, I want to do my part to do my my part to be an uh, innovator and a pioneer. You know, with, with wrestling today and beyond. So, you know, I definitely want to carry on that principles that he started. So let's go and back up a little bit to where we wanted to start off with and say, you said you were a wrestling fan growing up. Absolutely. How did you start off in wrestling? How did you get your start? A lot of guys, you know, broke in at an independent level. Uh, they kind of, nowadays, they get called up with the WWE up to the NXT and everything. How did you get your start? Well, I was brought to the business by uh, Ivan Koloff, uh, Cowboy Nelson Royal, and the Andersons. Uh, which at that which time, version of the Andersons? Uh, well, only in Gene, only Gene, in Lars? Gene, uh, with, with, with Gene, Lars, and, okay. and then Oli, and then, you know, Arn. Arn later on, right, right. and what uh, And I, uh, I got so much knowledge <laughs> on top of that. And, you know, I, I, I took amateur wrestling. I wrestled with uh, Iowa State Hawkeyes. And which uh, I had a scholarship on that, but it's, it's just uh, amazing. Because Dan Gable is one of my heroes growing up, wrestling as well. And then, then a few years I've had help here with the MMA, UWF in Japan, and guys along the way, like uh, some of the guys here, like Jerry DeKey Lawler, um, uh, Jake Snake Roberts, and, and Luke, that's right, Luke Bess, and Harley Race. And, and I, I mentioned Dusty earlier, Dusty Rose, Big Flair, and some, some, some of the best people in the business, you know, I mean, I've been really blessed and fortunate to learn from and, and to this day have, have great friends like Jake and, and Diamond Dallas Page and uh, uh, Bobby Blaze with Smoky Mountain Wrestling, Jim Cornette, and, uh, those, Tracy Smothers, Rock and Roll Express, Ricky Morton, Robert Gibson, uh, beautiful Bobby Eaton. Uh, I mean, those, those guys, I mean, it's a, not that their, their knowledge is immeasurable and it's helped me so much through the years, not just in the States, but you know, going overseas and wrestling different styles, and, you know, meeting guys like Harold Wild from Mexico, uh, Great Buddha from Japan. They have passed away. Yes, yes. God rest his soul. And it was such an honor to be in the ring with them. Um, connect. And I'm the Mascaris. Right. It was great. Yeah, I saw him walking in. You know, it's fantastic to look at this guy. You know, it's hard not to you know, mark out, for lack of a better term, in front of these guys when they've been doing this for so long that they've made such a name for themselves internationally. You know, Mill rarely wrestles in the U.S. Right. But he's made such a name for himself in his home country that you can't help but have that to translate back over to see him and know that this man is 70 plus like 72, 74, and still wrestling, not as much as he used to, but the fact that he can still go out there and perform at a high level is, is fantastic. Oh, amazing, amazing, amazing. You know, and you know, big guys like Hiro Matsuda, Billy Robinson. A lot of the old school shooters, uh, a lot of those uh, Danny real Hodge. tough guys. Yeah. Real <laughs> tough guys. <laughs> I mean, we do a funny, one, funny story one time. Uh, uh, we're honoring uh, Billy Robinson one time. And uh, uh, it turned out Billy Robinson, Danny Hodge, we're all in the same, and, and Terry and Dory Funk Jr. were right there. And, well, that's how much trouble for me. Uh, oh, my word. And when it comes up, I'm standing between Hodge and uh, Danny Hodge and uh, Mr. Robinson, and he said, hey, guys, he's a shooter. 
Right, voice to me, right? <laughs> and they're all getting the grappling stance. I'm like, Jimmy, what are you doing? Oh my god. Are you trying to kill me? Oh my god, they're both smiling. Like, oh, jeez. But, uh, oh yeah, great times, man. Those guys helped me out more than anything I can pay them back for. I mean, they're just, they're worth of knowledge and some rest what, when you were starting, what was the type of training you were getting, aside from going and, and getting the input from all these veterans, all these legends, what what type of training did you have to go through? Did you go through the WCW training camp? Uh, actually, the three old-timers I mentioned, uh, Nelson Merle, the uh, Andersons, and um, Kavikoloff, I, I went through them. They're, they're the ones that broke me in to train me, right? Okay. And at the same time, I was wrestling collegiately, <laughs> so I, I, I couldn't put on weight to save my life because anybody knows anything about collegiate wrestling, we, we train like track stars. So I, I was pretty... As a, as a track person, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, so we're like, like lean and mean for the longest time until, you know, I got to college started, you know, you, you know, training more towards, you know, bodybuilding and powerlifting, that type of thing, and, and more cross-training, basically, you know, but... Um, yeah, yeah, it was it was different, you know, back then because I was doing a bunch of things at the same time with collegiate wrestling, with the MMA, which we had fan creation. You know, we didn't have an octagon then like there is now with the UFC. Right, right. Um, and then with uh, our wrestling at the same time. So I mean, I was a pretty busy body. <laughs> as, as, as someone who's done track and cross country and done marathons, I can sympathize. I, I. Uh, I was, I think it was my first marathon back in 2010, and I was trying to get into bodybuilding at that time, and I went on weight myself and realized, I really don't want to carry this much weight for 26 miles, so I immediately mm-hmm. stopped anything related to weightlifting and just concentrated on distance running, right. and and by the end of it, by the time the marathon came around, I was I was back to a nice, you know, nice enough weight, I'm still kind of on the heavy side for, for a runner at 200, but... I seen I seen football players out there and they're <laughs> oh, oh yeah. It's like you know, you're, 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 you're kinda you kinda get the once over. You right. you, you kinda look at them and you're like, You are way in the wrong body type for the sport, pal. Yeah, when I did the MMA, you know, that was when the uh, Ken Shamrock was starting out, uh, Dan Severn. Uh yeah, you know, Gary Albright and uh I think the Jack, Gary Albright, yeah. Uh, the, the, the Japanese champion Kana, who had a uh, uh, MMA bouts with uh, Vader a few times. And yeah, Vader did, uh, uh, Leon White did a few uh, things as well. And uh, it, it was great to see Leon later in the professional wrestling side, you know what I mean? Cause, when you've seen him on the... Yeah, yeah that, was, that was really cool, you know. Now, something I had mentioned after Blackjack Williams' unfortunate passing just about uh, uh, less than a week ago was that the difference, you know, you, you mentioned all these real tough guys, Billy Robinson and, and uh, the Anderson brothers and and all these other real, you know, loose says. And I made mention of this on our Facebook page, the Shadow Fire Promotions Facebook page, that if you look at what WWE tries to tell you today, you cannot be a successful wrestler unless you're at least six foot five, have biceps just ripping out of your arms, have the washboard abs. But if you look at guys like say Mulligan or, you know, Lord Clears or someone else, they're not always these huge muscular bodybuilders. They, they, you know, Dick the Bruiser and Crusher. Yes. They're pretty, you know, if you look at them like, gee, they're pretty average looking physique wise. Right, right. Not, that's not to say they couldn't go and hand you your fanny. You know, they'll, they'll still hand you your ass. Don't get me wrong. You know, you don't, don't you know, you know, see Crusher drinking beer. Oh, yeah, he's just some fat yeah. beer drinking dude. I'll take him, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Okay, here you go. Here's your ass. Here's your head. Would you like anything else? When, you know, I, I think I left your arm back over there. I guess they think you may have another. <laughs> <laughs> Very much so. Very much. And and, and and I wanted to kind of bring out and get your thoughts on that type of thing because you kind of straddle both areas, both your grand uncle and the people that you received training from when you were breaking in to the modern day and kind of get your thoughts on physique and, and how important it is to have a certain look, whether it be in terms of body type or in terms of your gimmick or, or, or the face or anything else. Well, you know, it's good to have the body. It's good to have the look and, and all that, but you've got to have substance behind it because you never know when you're going to need that knowledge to protect yourself. Sometimes, guys, I mean, anything can happen at a ring. You know what I mean? And it's always good to have the knowledge of knowing what to do at the right times. And if talking about guys like, uh, we, we, the guys we just mentioned, uh, 
Bob Backlund was a big influence on me as well. Bob uh, Backlund, the current championship collegiate wrestler, obviously the World Wrestling Federation champion for something like five years. Right. And uh, certainly, even even in the 1970s, Bob did not look very, no. you know, he looked like an average looking dude. I know that in the, the Cross Illustrated magazines, they used to like to call him Howdy Doody, you know, Richie Cunningham. <laughs> And, and, of course, it was all in good fun, but, you know, he wasn't the most impressive-looking guy, but he'd tie you up in knots, too. Oh, yeah. I mean, you had Bob Backlund and Les Ford. I mean, he was, back then, he was the man of a thousand holds. You know, then Malenko came along. Malenko, and he was, right? and then Jericho was a thousand for I know four more. Yeah, he went to Washington to look it up, right? <laughs> you know? Um, and, you know, Gene Anderson. Uh, Gene Anderson and Cowboy Bob Gordon Jr. always fascinated me because they had tremendous strength, and you wouldn't know it, and because they had what uh, mountain climbers call tendon strength, right? That's why they could balance themselves on their few fingers in the cliff. And, and Regal's the same way. He's deceptively strong. I mean, it's like uh, I've seen Gene Anderson take guys like twice his size down to his knees and grab their thumb. And it, it, it's like... I've learned that technique, but yeah. Certain guys, if, if they, they, that tennis, if they grab you, you, you have no, you know, you just want to cry. They shake your hand, you're still up there. Like, my hand. Yeah, and, I, and I've seen guys like that do amazing feats of strength. I've seen Cowboy Bob Jr. pick up press slam Hulk Hogan back when he was 300 some pounds with one arm and give him a backbreaker. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, it's amazing what those guys can do. Just, just deceptively, deceptively strong. So, you know, you brought up the, the changing times and, and what happened in the ring, but a lot of times, especially in the 60s and 70s, a lot of it was what could happen outside, too. You know, there yes. was a story that was published somewhere, I forget where, they had mentioned Mulligan's famous comeback match uh, against Bruno because a week or two weeks earlier, some fan had stabbed him in the leg, opened up a huge gash. Mm -hmm. Grill him on soon, so they threw him to the security. The security didn't know what the hell to do with him. They thought it was just part of the act, so they right. threw the guy back. And Mulligan had got his leg fixed up and come back a week later uh, for Bruno's comeback. Right. And, you know, it, it was a great payday for Bruno Ball. McMahon sold out, McMahon Sr. had sold out Madison Square Garden. Bruno was a conquering hero. Right. Slammed Wyndham twice, Blackjack Mulligan twice, <laughs> pinned him, the crowd went nuts. Everyone got a big payday. Bruno was going home, you know, the New Yorker, uh, right. Madison Square Garden was his home. Everyone's on their feet. Mulligan's like, I didn't really have to do a damn thing for it, and I wasn't in any sort of condition to <laughs> to, to go and keep him. So everyone is, is, uh, is, goes home happy, right. Uh, right. Which, which, of course, is Vince McMahon Jr.'s, you know, philosophy. Everyone goes home happy at the end right. of the day. Right. Of course. But it was, you know, what what you mentioned. Now, did did any of these guys you travel with, did they ever tell you stuff? Hey, you know, it's not just learning how to defend yourself in the ring. Watch out for these nut jobs who are going to go and say, oh, I hate you, and stab you with a beer bottle or something. Yeah, matter of fact, uh, I was, you know, there's a term in our business called policeman, where uh, if uh, you have, like, you different territories, different companies have some kind of policeman. If some kind, something gets out of line, whatever, they would send the policeman to kind of, bring things in order, back down to earth, back to reality, etc. And during that time, Smoky Mountain Wrestling, I was one of those uh, policemen, right? Because uh, there were a couple of times where I would help save some of the boys that were out, get, get into trouble and fights and all that. And ever since then, they took me out with them on the road. And I was like their DD or, or, or whatever, because they knew I didn't you know, drink or anything, and, and they knew I had their back if anything happens. Yeah, there, there was a couple, few guys that had to, like, <laughs> freak back down to earth, you know, but it, it was all good, and, you know, and I was glad to get out in that fashion. You know, one of the one of the names you mentioned is Bob Orton Jr., and, and he was so great in a lot of the early uh, Coliseum video segments where they had the cooking and the skins and stuff, and he's like, yeah, you know, I can't tell my wife this, and it was just a shame, he was always so hurt with that cast on his arm, you know, just it's a shame it just never healed up properly. <laughs> It's just a crying shame, you know. Injuries happen. How will the Iron Mike Sharp with his <laughs> ongoing black brace? Yeah. <laughs> Mike, Mike Sharp has recently passed, of course, and, oh, and and some great stories have been told about Mike Sharp. And uh, no. I think uh, either Jim Ross or uh, someone had mentioned some stories that that he had an OCD uh, 
going on, but but they said, you know, like, oh, and a lot of people, and I, I'd love to get your feedback, and there's a lot of people, a lot of the newer people, like, oh, Jabroni, he's a job guy, he never did anything, but the, the, the so-called job guys, the preliminary guys, were the ones that all the top guys loved to work with because exactly. they were safe, they knew what they were doing, and they didn't have any ego about losing. <laughs> you know, the, Those the guys today squad, would be stars. The job squad. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, I was talking with someone earlier, exactly. another star, and, and he said, you know what, I don't even remember what the hell I did yesterday, much less remember this one match from 30 years ago. I don't care. Look, I don't get paid by the hour. I'm in there. You want me to lose? Whatever. I don't care. You know, you take you know, those guys back then and at any given time put them in, in a main event spot or a mid card spot and, and have, have a tremendous match. Like, that's how good the, the workers, the wrestlers back then were top to bottom. You know what I mean? They were like they were like studio musicians, you know. Everyone liked studio musicians. They worked, uh, they were able to musically adapt to a lot of different styles. Right. They didn't mind, you know, being uncredited and let the band get the, the credit for it. Uh, yeah, that's and, true and passion the, for the business right the, there. The, the, the preliminary wrestlers, you know, the guys like the Mike Sharps, the Dale Wolf, yes. uh, 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 the Duke of Dorchester, Pete Doherty, you know, all these journeyman guys, they would travel on the road all the time and, hey, you know, a thousand bucks for five minutes of work. Yeah, you go and sit there before the bell and attack the guy, he kicks the snot out of you, didn't you? Hey. Nice little payday. I didn't have to do much, and, uh, and the guys love them because you know all their styles. You don't mind selling their offense. It's none of this. I got to get my stuff in. That's right. You know, putting butts in seats and making money. That's what it's all about, bro. So uh, <laughs> when you when you first debuted, now did you you did not first debut in World Champion Wrestling, did you? No, I I, I, I was in the business several years before that. <laughs> so when you when you, had long, your, when you had your when you had your, we'll get later to the different pros that you worked for. <laughs> okay. uh, when you when you first debuted, when you had that first match with all the training you received in in the ring and out ring, all the advice. Did you kind of think to yourself, "I got this," or were you like, "Oh crap"? Yeah, I, I received some good advice long ago. Uh, it's like when you think you know everything you is to know about this business, it's time to retire and quit and hang up your boots. So I've always kept an open mind. I've always been hungry to learn more, and really that's what's kept even up to this day. I'm still. Absorbing knowledge, you know, to get better. Yes, I should get butterflies for you know. You stop, you know. I think I think it was Steve Austin that said, "Hey, you know, I, I look at me. I've done it all. You know, I've won five time WWE champion. You know, I've been out there. Everything. Right. I glad the glass breaks, and I'm still nervous as hell before I hit that curtain. It, it never goes not, away. If you're not, <laughs> you're done. This, you're ended. Right. It, it, it's still there. The butterflies are always with <laughs> So when you when you went, when you finally got the call up to World Championship Wrestling to WCW, right. mm-hmm. who who was that person that called and said, Hey Stro, you know, we we got a place for you here. Can you come on to uh, to Atlanta here and, and, and let's talk? Well, up to when I was there contractually, I was uh, they were doing nightly deals. You know, I would I would go do some shows in between the, the promotions I was at the time, and uh, the guys responsible for help helping me get there. Were Hulk Hogan, Macho Marion, Savage, and Eric Bischoff, in which uh, Savage knew, heard of me, and helped him heard of me through Jerry Jarrett, got a Memphis, who uh, Jerry worked with friends. And Jerry Jarrett was the one that likes legit guys, guys that got to go, guys that could take care which of things. The South was kind of each each territory kind of had their own style they liked. You know, Bill Watts in Texas kind of yes. liked to have the ex-football guys, the, you know, McMahon, both senior and junior kind of favored the big bodies, the, right. the Carolinas, the Crockets, all kind of favored the technical mm-hmm. people. So, those guys were interested in a couple of the you know, big guys from WCW, and the, the guy, the tryout match I had that actually got in was uh, with uh, Chavo Guerrero Jr., which was uh, I'm, I'm friends with all, all the Guerreros, just like the Armstrongs, great wrestling family. We used to pray together for matches. Um, I know. I'll, ne- I'll never forget. I'm, you know, after a match, you know, sitting there, and uh, you get you get all these agents coming up to you saying, you know, have you done this or that? Yada yada. You know what I mean? It's all good. And, you know, giving different stories. You know what I mean? And like, uh, you didn't know which one to believe, right? Right. You know right. I mean? You kind of take a little bit of each thing. And Wait. And it would, I started thinking back to my grandpa's. Always know who the boss is. So that's the guy to go to. 
throw it. Things get tied, River. Eric Bischoff walks in. Says, uh, you know, great match. We can use a great talent like you. Welcome aboard. And no sooner he said that, all those agents said, great match. That was awesome. You know what I mean? And I knew right then who to go to if I had an issue or a question or anything. I said, Eric's the guy. And as soon as I walked out, there's Arn Anderson. All, all the uh, guys in the company went great to shake my hand, welcome me aboard. It, uh, it was like the greatest feeling. Uh, there, there was, there, what, what you just mentioned was really funny because I remember hearing something else like that. It might have been on someone's podcast, something where, you know, Vince had a meeting with the wrestler and, and all the day, Briscoe and Patterson, Jerry Briscoe and Pat Patterson, and, and you know, it's like, no, I can't do it this way, you know, I think I should do it this way, yeah. let me, let me kind of show you, oh yeah, you're right, you're right, right, you know, <laughs> McMahon, Vince McMahon walks back in and says, you know, no, I like my way better, and of course, oh, yeah, absolutely, your, your way is, <laughs> <laughs> like, you, always, you, know, you always know which side your bread is buttered on, yeah, well, no doubt. And, and it doesn't change, you know, wh whether you're in wrestling or anywhere else, you know, it's like, Wait a second, dude. Didn't you just tell me five seconds ago on my desk that, that <laughs> it was way better than, than, than this other guy? Said, yeah, but he's an SVP. That's what happened to Puerto Rico, right? And Jose, uh, uh, the invader, Jose Gonzalez, was the booker at the time. Uh, I, I, I guess he's taking out for Dutch. But I guess Dutch came back a little later for it. But he was asked to be, to, uh, Amigo, uh, I let you come up with finish tonight. And, okay, so I'll do a few things. Climb, and then he said, I tell you. I tell you what we could do. And he, and he originally goes back to the original finish that he came up with. I said, why did you ask me? <laughs> you won't do it anyway. What a rib, you know? Uh, too funny. Now, now, you know, you mentioned Eric Bischoff as well as Hogan and Savage. And let me get back to Hogan and, uh, Hogan and Randy Savage in just a minute. You know, Randy Savage passed away a few years back. But with Eric Bischoff, he was in charge. But did you ever get a feeling like, you know, whose opinion is more valuable in terms of the technical aspect of my match because the road agents are guys who used to do this, where Eric Bischoff is a guy who used to be an announcer and works his way up to be an executive. Right. You know, how, how can he critique my match? Did you ever have that kind of feeling in your head like, you know, yeah, you're my boss, but like, maybe I should be talking to the road agents about the technical aspects of it. Yeah, well, I, I would still get advice from the road agents about what I need to do, so forth, put things together, and and, and, and creatively, you know, I, I think Eric and I were kind of go, we're on syn syncings creatively because he was that he was the guy to come to with ideas about the Maestro persona and everything, and, uh, and he was still one of the responsible for hooking up the elaborate platform, coming out of the rafters with the baby grand piano and everything, and Sting and I were going to at the time coming out in the four harnesses in which that's an interesting story itself because I was just explained that to uh, Diana Hart earlier right, right. about I went to Bret Hart for permission to do that because this was right after passing Owen. Right, and Owen for, for those who don't remember uh, in 1999, May 23rd Owen Hart was to descend from the ring on a on a harness as, as a kind of a superhero type thing much like Howard Stern had done a little earlier with, with Bartman and be the superhero character and he would kind of stop maybe a foot or two above the ring like he couldn't go and then just kind of fall down with a big comic splat or something and something happened that no one really knows what to this day but something happened that the quick release that had, had unintentionally been triggered and he fell something like some 70, 80 feet from the ceiling the rafters of the Kemp Arena to the ring and then had his fantastic conditioning unfortunately probably kept him alive for a few more minutes while officials including Jerry Lawler had tried to revive him but unfortunately uh, the trauma was too much and he unfortunately had passed away and on the live pay-per-view which has got to be the most difficult thing oh, yeah. to, to do when you're you know and I know there's been a lot of criticism over the years of Vince McMahon for agreeing to go on with the show but it's you know it's a very trying circumstance when you learn that one of your guys just had this incredible fall and you don't know mm -hmm. you know whether he's going to live or die. I was uh yeah well I went to Brett and asked for permission to do it back because you know Cowboy Nelson World one of my trainers was good friends with Stu Hart that's how guys just broke up their hearts 
you know, a while back, even before you know, WCW, so I went to him for permission, and he gave me the green light to do it, because otherwise, if he didn't want me to do it, I would have done it, so I went ahead with the entrance, and, and being, coming down from the platform with the harness, <laughs> uh, those things are strong, man, those are really strong, and I had worked with the stunt people, like, a few weeks prior, doing the same deal, and uh, one time, <laughs> I couldn't get the darn thing off my tights. <laughs> so, and, and it was, I, had, I had to bang on the piano as it kicked in the bass because the crowd noise was drowning out the right. sound. It was, it was a pack of the nitros back then. And I couldn't get the darn thing off my tights one time, so I, I had to get to the ring and have a match. And every time I would hit that canvas, that, that harness would dig in my little lumbar. And I was like, I'm on my teeth, but thinking the whole time, oh, I can't, please, please, I can't get this match. Yeah, with, this you know, man. gotta get over with. Yeah, it's good, it's great. Somebody stop the damn match. Yeah, no joke. <laughs> I don't know how I winged it, but it, I, I got through with it. But yeah, it, you know, it was, uh, it was unique, interesting. They spent a lot of money on the platform and everything, and I, I was very honored to be something part of unique interest like that. Well, you know, the, the three names you mentioned as being the biggest help to you when you started off in World Championship Wrestling, Eric Bischoff, Hulk Hogan, Randy Savage, were also kind of very controversial figures. And then what you just said has been helping you out is an example of how controversial they are. And, and what I mean by that is some people say, oh, you know, they were so selfish, they never helped anyone in their life. And, and you know, they were just all about themselves. And here you are saying they were such an instrumental help to my career and, and getting me started totally. off. So when you when you had got the job in, in Los Angeles Wrestling, how was the Maestro pitched to you, and what was your initial reaction to it? Well, my vision of the Maestro uh, didn't really come out until later in my run, where I always envisioned the Maestro would be more of a, a darkish family opera type. You know, it's something uh, like bad music and things would set them off, you would snap and go crazy, and then things would come back. Almost like a, a, a Sybil, if you will. Right, right, right. Just something like that. Or I think the WWE did that with uh, Luke Gallows, I think, or someone, I forget. And which that didn't really come out through my feuds with uh, Buff Backwell and Nurse Cat Miller and, and, and guys like that. Which, uh, interesting enough, the um, feud with David Flair was supposed to be leading to something even bigger you know, with the Flair family, which I was very excited about at one time. And, uh, we had vignettes and everything ready to roll with it. And then next thing you know, Eric leaves for a little while and we had a revolving door bosses. And, yeah, had a revolving door bosses before Eric, but... <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's just like, you know, just like a, not just my deal, but a lot of deals were like changed around and, and it, a lot of confusion going on at the time. But, you know, we, we all tried to make the most of it. They all made a few eggs and, uh, and we had some great people that helped us out, you know, through that time, I mean, Kevin Sullivan was a, a tremendous help. Uh, Terry Taylor was a tremendous help with all the young guys. Um, and those those two helped me out a lot, you know, because I knew Kevin for years, for years, you know what I mean? And I knew Terry for a while. And, um, you know, and I like Kevin's style, because Kevin's more wrestling-based, you know what I mean? I, I, and I, I, I get a lot what what Kevin was doing with all the wrestling, like, like he but the cruiserweights and everything, and Terry Taylor with the creativity and everything. I mean, I, I, I get that because, you know, he's one of James Brown coming in. That, that was a huge honor. And he's another guy who knew my grandma before this, George. And it was yeah, great yeah. seeing him in the eyes. And, and Ernest the Cat Miller was, I'll be honest, he was so much fun. I mean, what a great guy. I mean, we... He was, he was he's funny. And, uh, you know, just, just, you know, I never met him in person, but just the stuff he does on TV. And, and you look at commercials on WWE on some of their DVDs for uh, The Rock. It's like, oh, the things I used to say. And it's like, yeah. And, Ernest Miller used to say a lot of it too, and in the movie The Wrestler is like, hey, you know, you want to go over a match? Yeah, we'll go over a match. You be the face, I'll be the heel. How about that? It, <laughs> and you're sitting there like, what the hell? Right. <laughs> I, you know, I mean, one night, I mean, and back then, WCW was just on top of the freaking world. I mean, one night in the rain, started, the other night, you'd be some Piper or Flair, Hogan, Savage. Paul and another, Nash. another one, Roddy Piper, lost too soon. Oh, unbelievable. And, and Roddy had said, you know, in the weeks leading up to his passing, he said, no, I came back to WWE because I did a lot of stuff to my body I probably shouldn't have, and I know I'm not going to live very long. And then, unfortunately, he predicted it. You know, it was, back then, it was so immeasurable, the talent that they had, you know, and from all over the world, too, you know, the best cruiser race from all over Mexico. In which I saw a lot of my friends from Mexico that I was in AAA with Jake Snake Roberts. You know, come come you know, come over to WCW and do their thing. 
and Japan and in different Europe. They had a great international talent. I, you know, I remember Starcade 90, they yeah. had the, the uh, Pat O'Connor tournament with all these great international teams. It was the first time a lot of people have seen the Starcade. Great right? yeah. material, Conan. Conan had a totally different look then. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's one of my favorite Starcades. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's got so much great international talent and a lot, you know. The Steiners and Muda and Saito, and yeah. Muda, who took a lot of his stuff from, uh, uh, I can't think of it now, uh, uh, Gary Hart used to manage him. Oh, Kabuki. Yes, thank you. Kabuki, could, uh, yeah. I had the image. I got, you know, I'm really great at faces. I, I never forget a face, but names escape me. Yeah, Gary, he, he, he gave me some good advice a while back. Yeah, what a great guy. I was a big fan. Of the, the world class, you know, Bill Watts, era, you know, era of wrestling. It was, it was a great, it was, it was great, you know, and and you know, I, I had also made mention of this, you know, to establish world class championship wrestling in WWE for what it is and what it did would go against WWE's tradition of saying were the only thing that ever existed because in Dallas, right. you may have been top of the hill every, you know, in 49 other states and 49 and a half. In Dallas, the Von Erich boys were, were it. Oh, yeah. They, they, Hulk yeah. Hogan is a no one compared to the Von Erich boys. Uh, the Von Erichs, they, 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 they were Texas wrestling, you know what I mean? Back then, and then you had uh, the Jake, Junkyard Dog was huge in New Orleans. People in New Orleans loved Junkyard Dog. Bill yeah, Watts, Bill Watts, uh, Bill Watts yeah. built his whole territory around him pretty yeah. much. They did it a second time with uh, Ron Simmons. Ron Simmons, right, right. And uh, another another great guy, Ron Simmons. A uh, really good guy, even to this day. Now, when, uh, when did you, uh, you mentioned kind of the revolving door of bosses, and I'm sure there was, you know, everywhere you go there's always chatter, amongst people like did, you know you kind of get a feeling like this doesn't look well for us you know what what the heck happened we're at top of the world and now we're here and i'm kind of getting a little nervous i'm not sure what's going to happen well especially when the ted turner sold his uh, shares at aol i, I knew things were, yeah i just had a feeling that the way things were going the aol's not big wrestling <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. When when the one person who's been advocating for your company, no matter how much money it lost for the past what uh, ten or so years, you know, 1991, I think he bought it. I remember one time I'm sitting with Ric Flair, Ellie Murnick walks in with, with some figures, I guess house or figures, I believe, and uh, he started thumbing through them, right? And I remember Rick shaking his head, going, oh, "My God." <laughs> I knew that was a good sign, <laughs> you know what I mean? And so, yeah, Rick, Rick, Rick knew what was going on even before the office did. I mean, that's much, how much he knew about. He, he just kind of had that feeling. Yeah. Well, I know a lot of people talk about WCW's only good years were, you know, 96 to 98, and it's like, no, I don't think so at all. I think, you know, uh, this is a little before Turner, but I mean, 87 with the Crockett Cup in 88, Star K90, we talked about that. And yeah. The, the Slam Breeze, the early 90s there, and, and Ricky Steamboat coming back for another run with Ric Flair. You know, there were a lot of great years. I think there was just, as you mentioned, kind of the revolving door of, of people in charge that, that killed things. You know, I don't know if I'll ever get a chance to, but I need my bucket list to have my bucket list being in the ring with Ricky Steamboat, Ric Flair, and all, all these great wrestlers and workers at the time. You know, there's one guy, I don't know if I ever get a chance to get a ring with him, but I would love to, to have a great match with him. That'd be Kurt Angle. Uh, that guy's and amazing. judging from the condition of his body that's being reported, that's yeah. not looking likely and, and as the years go by. As, as a brother to Matt, not just professional wrestling, but amateur style and MMA and all that, I, I have so much respect. And he amazes me. Even to this day, he amazes me. Condition he's in, uh, what he's done, uh, what a, a great person he is outside the ring. And the fact that he's still going and, and doing doing things that he's doing, you know what I mean? And on top of that, being an Olympic gold medalist. Yeah. You, you, you got to really me. admire, you know, I, I looked at his book and, you know, you read the stuff about him and the fact that he just has this attitude of, I don't care whether it's two people, I'm going to go, you know, 100% for these two people. And right. you read his book and what he's done training for the Olympics and with the cracked vertebrae, and everything, and I looked at some of the stories of, of the weights he lifted and what he's done, and I'm like, wow, 
wow, is that even humanly possible? Is, is, that, is that within the limitations of the human body to, to be able to pull off some of that stuff? And to do an amateur match, you know, there's a lot of stuff that goes on with the head and neck mm -hmm. because, you know, anyone that's, that's ever wrestled knows, you know, I'm a Marine, you know, they say, take the guy's head. Right. The head goes, the body follows. That's right. Exactly. You know, you can't, you don't have a choice. It no don't matter how much of a jerk off he is, how many drugs he's on, whatever, take his head. The body has to follow. That's it. And if, if the body doesn't follow his head, you've got a bigger problem on your hands. <laughs> no doubt. No, that, 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 that's the way ending. You know, just, you know, you just, you know I, I see a lot of myself in the, the fact that, you know, you know, work is I, I've been there. You know, USA Freestyle Greco. I, I came really close to qualifying the US Olympic team at one time, and just the people just have to realize your Olympic athletes are a breed apart from your normal athlete. They train that much harder, and, and they're dry. Day, you know, you, the, the musicians they say where they're practicing. Practice, yes. You know, you're playing your guitar every day, eight hours a day, maybe ten, twelve. You're always, you know, screwing around with that guitar. It's not old. American Idol's on home. You're up in their room with that guitar. You know, Olympic level athletes. All you're doing all day long is training. And, and you know, that's what you're getting paid for. And that, to and train. people like that have always inspired me. You know, to, to bring out the best. That they bring out the best in people they ring with and that they work with and, and themselves. You know, I mean, that's that's what it's all about. You know, and and, and Kurt, it's a, he's a walking inspiration. Now, when WCW closed, when 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 they, when you finally kind of saw the writing on the wall with that, what was your contract status? You under a, in a contract at that time? Yes, yes, and it was nearing, it was almost up, and, and I had people financially tell financial advisors saying, you know, get out while you can, because I heard a lot of money being lost, basically, and this and this before it got really bad, so uh, I decided not to be new. And uh, then later, uh, yeah, I saw Nitro's and Thunders being taped at the same night. And poor Lance Storm was being worked to death. It's a lot It's a lot to do. I mean, you know I mean, sitting there watching it for four or five hours is, is kind of rough. When you're out there and you have to be at the arena, you know, having worked with independents, doing media stuff. Right. And you're there with the boys at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, 1 o'clock in the afternoon. You're there until 10, 11 o'clock at night. It can be a long day. Oh yeah, totally. So when they when they closed, when when they closed, you were off. You were when they finally said this is it, and Vince McMahon had, had finally decided to buy them. Right. Were, did you have it? Were you under a contract? Did your contract extend over to the WWE's purchase? No, no, because it, it it was up before the, the takeover. Right. Uh, about a few uh, some months prior, actually, to that. So it was a little bit before it. You know. Vince actually took over the company. But, you know, because at that point, first, of, there were rumors that Eric was going to buy it, but that fell through. And, and you know, it's unfortunate. That, that was back when everybody wanted to be a cruiserweight. Right. Well, Someone had to tell Mike, Big Mike Awesome. I think, I think it was Lance. <laughs> Someone had to finally tell Mike Awesome because he was starving himself, right? Right. And, and I think Lance was doing this at the time, not a cruiserweight. <laughs> Look at you, you know what I mean? Bless his heart, he tried though. Yeah. Well, I, you know, with, with Eric Bischoff and, and what he said in interview after interview, you know, I would have bought it, but without the TV slot, it was useless to me. Right. And, and it's unfortunate, you know, you look back at it 10 years later and think, oh man, if only he could have had the money, you know, he could put on a streaming platform, made a crap ton of money off the library, but how, how can you be, you know, uh, uh, Mistress Cleo or whatever, and, and see that bar and say, if I shove out a million and a half or three million or, you know, whatever they were asking for, you know, right. maybe more at that point, you know, how am I going to be able to justify this purchase to sit in this stuff in the hopes that one day I might get a chance to, to offer it to DVD or, or, you know, VHS or something. Uh, yeah, you know, absolutely. That would have changed everything. So, when, did, were you kind of hoping to get that call from, from Connecticut saying, hey, you know, we'd like to have you come on down here? Well, I don't know. It was during a time where it, it was politi politically motivated. You, you saw a lot of WCW people got, like, you know, done the way they were done, <laughs> being done. Yeah, the, the, the invasion, unfortunately, a lot of people's opinion, which has a lot of merit, is that they were brought in simply to prove that the WWF at the time was the superior federation to that wrestling stuff that you guys do down south over there. You guys wrestle and we entertain. 
Well, I actually I tried to go to ECW, but what happened was he said, uh, folded, unfortunately folded, folded. They, they folded about two months after. Yeah, it was like a domino effect. So it was like, oh, well, that, was, that was a huge thing for yeah. wrestling in, in a negative way to have you know out of the three major federations because Ring of Honor wasn't the type of presence that it is now. Right. To have the two of the three major federations folding within months of each other, I'm sure there are probably a lot of wrestlers who are like, oh no, I am going to have to get a day job again. Right, right. And what, I, with the WWE thing, I, I kind of wanted to do something with them or I would, something fresh, you know what I mean? Where, you know, it wasn't just a, a WCW guy or anything, you know, it was something that they could use to some of their creation where they can, you know, put out a little fun. You know, so that, that's where I was my way of thinking because I, I, I just, the whole concept, you know, with w, just a WCW guy coming in and, you know, I, I knew there was heat there. So, with the WCW, right. so, uh, so it's, I, but it's cool, you know, I'm friends, uh, I have to have a man's a while back, uh, with the mother-in-law, who lost some fire and shit, and the rest of the family and, you know, Stephanie and, uh, Shane, Vince, I think they were all really cool. Thank you for working with me. You know, I was just funny because they were great to me. All the talent were great to me and, and all that. You know, and Michael Hayes was super cool because I know Michael Hayes from uh, way back. And, um, uh, Pat Patterson was here. Uh, Pat Patterson was here, cool. right? Fact, I am. Um, uh, Chris Benoit and I tried out in 1985. It's a good WWE. And, he had a great match with Owen, late Owen Hart. I had a great match with Scotty Riggs. And it almost happened. And, uh, Pat Patterson was high us. Um, so it was a Sid Vicious. But uh, it, it wasn't the cards at the time. It just didn't pan out. But I mean, those, you know, you know, every, everybody in WWE, from my experience, I mean, everybody was super cool. And, it, it's, uh, and that's the thing. If we had a, a guy like McMahon from WCW, you know, that's where, you know, talking about Vince Russo coming in and his ideas. I mean, I'm sure it, in his mind he meant, meant well, but McMahon was the one in WWE got filtered the ideas. He was the yes or no guy. Right, you right. Know, he, and so if we had someone like McMahon filtering Vince, Vince Russo's ideas in WCW, I'm sure it would be much better. Right. Off. But, you know, we didn't have that there. And, and, and there's a lot of Vince Russo's ideas really for appeal to the WCW fans because I mean, they're more wrestling based. Right, that whole territory we talked about earlier, the whole right. the whole Carolinas and Virginia and the whole Crockett Jim Crockett Senior and Junior territory right. was based around guys that were more technical and to have it I mean for me, I, I agree with what you're saying. You know, Vince Russo probably could have used someone to say, you know what? This is a little too off the wall. Let's yes. take this one little piece that might work and work with this rather than take this completely unfiltered idea and say, well, let's see if it's against the wall and see if it sticks. Because, you know, one of the things that's always a head scratch to me is you've got a company that's based in Atlanta, Georgia. Right. Redneck City, Atlanta. You, you got, you know, no offense to Georgians, anyone that's listening, this, uh, this isn't personal. Uh, you know, you got all these rednecks, these hicks and, and everything, these proud southerners, you know, the rebel flag flyers and everything. I've got this great idea. We're going to do New York against the South. And you know what's going to be even better? We're going to have the South be the bad guys. Everyone's going to want to boo the South. And you're like, wait a second. I'm from the South. Why do I, huh? You know, why don't I want to boo the South? I, I'm from the South. I, I'm, from, I'm proud to be from Atlanta. Why would I want to boo these guys? Yeah. It, it was crazy, you know. Um, I mean, the idea I'm, had I'm, the I'm, idea had merit. It's just yeah. kind of kind of flipped the face heel side of it. I mean, a friend of mine, uh, one of my friends of mine that became world champion, I was very happy for it. I mean, there were, I mean, there were some good. I mean, Booker T became world heavyweight champion, which I thought I thought was long overdue. So did a lot of people. And because uh, I mean, to me, he should have been world champion years prior. And 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 honestly, I've always thought that. You know, all, all this, if you, if you notice, there were all this ascension at the time of the horsemen and, and, and all that, and, and the guys that pretty much laid the foundation. Well, we mentioned Piper, Ric Flair, Arn Anderson, and I, I don't know, I wouldn't say disrespected, but I, I just think that they, those guys, should they should have had a lot more input at the time because those are the guys 
Dusty Rhodes, and those are the guys that pretty much spilled the blood, did all the hard work, they laid a foundation for WCW and, and, and slash NWA. Right, right. The you know, these, yeah, those guys pretty much, and then they were, and they were still there with the company, so those guys should have a lot more input. And to have Rick in the last match of Nitro was probably the most fitting thing because right. it was his match with Sting and Clash that really kind of put Sting over for where he was. And, and you mentioned the Horsemen, and I spoke briefly to J.J. Dillon last year, and I chatted with him about the Horsemen DVD side in the Hall of Fame and everything. And he said, you know what? Everyone likes to talk shit about Vince McMahon, but, you know, he was very good to us. He, yeah. he had an opportunity to rewrite history any way he felt, and he, you know, he put us over. You know, he, he really put us over, you know, he, and he said something to the effect of more he really had to, given the fact that none of us had really wrestled, you know, for not as, as the four horsemen. I mean, obviously everyone had been there individually. You know, I, I honestly believe that if McMahon took the helm home with the with the horsemen, they, they would have been even bigger today. I thought in the early 90s, in the early 90s when Rick was in WWF at the time, right. I don't know if J.J. Dillon was working there or not, but they could have had a new horseman uh, built up with Rick, Kurt Hennig, the late Mr. Perfect, mm -hmm. uh, Michael, uh, Michael uh, Rotunda, Mike, Mike Rotunda, uh, IRS at the time would have been a great, you know, thing. Oh, yeah. And his tag team partner, Ted DiBiase. Oh, wow. Because as the million dollar man IRS, there's a rich gimmick, you know. Ted is very rich and very wealthy and, mm -hmm. you know, always clear jets everywhere. And that fit in with what Rick was doing. Yes. Kurt was familiar with Rick Flair and, and Mr. Perfect and everything would have been a, a great thing. And IRS is, of course, a finance themed gimmick. Oh, and, you know, More you might best. not have seen IRS in a tuxedo unless it was suspender, but, uh, <laughs> you know, you can certainly picture in terms of the overall concept of their gimmicks that a faction of the horsemen with those four could have been worked. Uh, it, uh, yeah, it's for the best right there. I mean, I, I enjoyed Mike Rotunda back when he was the varsity club. And he saw, like, it's a great wrestling site in Syracuse. I mean, tremendous wrestling. I mean, all four of those guys, Ted Yossi, a fan of for years. Yeah, one, one of the greatest seals in our business, and uh, uh, man, that, that would have been tremendous. I mean, I, I definitely would have been a big fan of that. Some, something else you mentioned, you know, the, the amateur background of Mike Rotunda, at the time when a lot of these guys broke in in the early 80s and the late 70s, you know, not only did you have to be a legit tough guy because they were going to go and rip your arms off, and you know, if they thought that you were messing with them or, or you weren't taking them seriously, mm -hmm. they'd go and make sure to replace your arm with a leg. Uh, Much of a time to watch brought Dr. Dead Steve Williams and uh, Terry Gordy into a um, round the Steiners because their Steiners were like they were rough and rugged at the time and they were just like putting it hurting on the tag teams, right? Right. Oh, man. What great matches those two teams had. But you also had to be a great amateur. Having a good amateur background like the Steiner brothers, oh, like, like uh, Dr. Death was almost uh, another prerequisite to, to getting into wrestling in the early 80s and the late 70s as well. It's Dr. Steve Williams, he's uh, from my mother, home state of Oklahoma. And to be an All-American in football and wrestling, that's that's just, that's big time. That's heavy. You know what I mean? Yeah. And yeah. one of the toughest men ever in the industry. I mean, I've seen him accomplish some amazing things. I mean, feats of strength. I mean, big Bubba Rogers holding him up with one arm in the air doing power slams. Uh, uh, Jim Jim Cornette had a great story about Bubba getting, like, his hand slammed to the door of a cab, and he's just like, brother, 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 you know, I got my, my hand stuck here, you know, and, and just call him as could be, you know, door shuts to lock him. God damn it, hurt now, fuck shit, you know. And, and, and Jim Cornette is standing there like, well, fuck shit, why the hell didn't you say something? It's like, I didn't want to go and sell it, brother. <laughs> <laughs> we just, and, we and, of course, him recently, and of course, Jim Cornette is, is fantastic at telling the story. Oh, Jim's with, with, you know, and, and his mile a minute, you know, style of talking. Right. And it's just all that much more hysterical. Well, he couldn't whip cream. That guy was such a wimp. And I was like, where the hell did he come up with these lines, you know? Oh, never done. <laughs> Jim, Jim great. So, so now backstage, were you ever a big river? Were you the kind of guy that, that wants to go and play a bunch of jokes and people and, and, and 
Oh, me? No. <laughs> yeah, right. No one ever did that. Of course not. That's a good idea. <laughs> oh, little birdie told us. <laughs> oh, no. Well, yeah, I've done a few. A few first nations, a few ribs. Uh, did one that Steiner one time. I went to Rick Steiner one time. That was pretty funny. The super glue, get the super glue, my rent car keys. And I took the thing. And, and then, Scott loved it. He took me out to dinner in Chicago for it. He thought it was the greatest thing ever. And, uh, <laughs> Oh, man, yeah, yeah. Um, I know I've met some of uh, Sean Foley and Al Venus. <laughs> we were in Puerto Rico together. That was a lot of fun. It's like a cigarette in Mr. Hughes. <laughs> yeah, I saw him do that. He's like lit. Still, the cigarette's still lit. He's like talking around everybody. He didn't, he didn't put it over. He just like kept walking around. <laughs> it was I think he, I think he knew. So. Yeah, the it, it, same thing. Didn't want to sell it. Oh, my God. So, so you got any good road stories? Oh, my God. Uh, Give us a couple of good road stories here, and then we'll get to the promotions you did stuff for. All right. Now, here's, uh, here's one Terry Funk, right? We're in San Diego. Uh, yeah. San Francisco Cow Palace. We're going to see the Super Bowl. Earlier today, we were doing promos leading up to that night. I'm going to do one with Cat Miller, with uh, Jimmy and Jill, going to And uh, Terry Funk's doing one about Smash Rick Flair that night. They had trash bag in his head. Like, put the best in Terry. He's like, Terry, what's in this trash bag? Terry says, tell me about the same response. He's like, I'm saving it for the interview. Right? <laughs> so uh, the, the promo starts, came out, starts, right? He reaches in the t- trash bag, pulls out this dead chicken. I don't know how in the heck he got on the plane or whatever. It may have picked up in the street. You know, claiming it is from the Double Cross Ranch, right? He says, you see this chicken? I shall now compare its anatomy to that of one Ric Flair. See these skinny legs? These are the legs of Ric Flair. See this beak? This is the schnoz of Ric Flair. And I'm going to take Ric Flair by the neck. He's grabbed the chicken he's saying this right. And I'm going to whip him like the dog that he is. He's beating the chicken on the ground for this flying. Dust the rose behind him. He's like takes a bump laughing. I spit up my water. That cameraman's shaking. The whole joint's are going to howl laughing, right? Later on that night, after the show, a good bit of hotel, they put us up in a really nice place, by the way. The bellboy usually gets the luggage in, in the front parking lot. He's walking around the parking lot with, with this same trash bag that looked like Terry Funk had earlier. I called him Uncle Terry because I, I adopted him in WCW. I said, well, now I'm your mom. Well, I adopted you. And I've been called Uncle Terry ever since. Well, I, I'm curious. So I go to the kid, right? The bellboy, and I was like, I mean, are you okay? What's going on? You know, he's like, he lost. And he, he said, some old man gave me this dead chicken. And I don't know what the heck to do with it. It was Terry. Oh, my goodness. Classic. You know, I always admire when, when, you know, whether you're the guy holding the microphone or you're one of the other wrestlers there and some guy just going off, you, you have to sit there and try and keep a straight face for it all. You know, uh, there's the famous clip, I know it's been seen a lot of times, the SummerSlam, when the big SummerSlam backdrop comes down. You know, oh, fuck it! <laughs> you know, they have, they have a clip, I think it was on the Cauliflower Alley Cup website, of Mean Gene doing something with Paul Orndorff. Like, you know, every day they're sworn outside my motel room. I got this limo pulling up to my motel. I can't get a moment for us. I got all these women coming to me. <laughs> and Gene is in there. And finally, he just kind of turned around, holding the microphone up to Mark, turned around, <laughs> and you can tell he's cracking up. He's trying so hard not to crack up. I, I used to I used to hang out with me, Gene and Bobby Heenan a lot during my time at WCW, and never a dull. It was great. Oh, always entertaining. One time, uh, well, I took two cases. One, one time, uh, after one of my matches, you know, I'm celebrating that Symphony go to pick her up, right? Thank God I didn't hear the commentary, Bobby was saying until afterwards in the playback. Because when I went to pick her up to celebrate like this, and uh, Bobby's like, that dropper, maestro, over the top rope. <laughs> if I heard that, I would have lost it. And Bobby knocked it, you know, collapsed. One time, I came into catering for the show, right? And there was like a big fuss with some of the boys, right? I noticed no cameras. See, I thought they were, you know, shooting a promo or something or a segment. But uh, it was just like a big little scuffle going on. And... Uh, and everything, and you have uh, Fritz Finley over there with me drinking coffee, laughing. You know, two, two tough guys, you know, nothing's gonna face them, right? And uh, 
and, and, and Stevie Ray comes over and I said, Stevie Ray, you know, Harlem Heat, you know, Stevie, right, what's right. going on, man? It's, it's just, it's just two non, non-fighting white boys, man. You can't even fight them. They're, they're lip-wristing each other and everything, and Bobby Heaton <laughs> walks around. And then, and see, Dean Malenko was with me, right? And Dean Malenko hardly ever, you know, chuckles, laughs, but Stevie Ray got him. He was laughing. Stevie Ray, Stevie Ray's so funny. And Bobby Heaton wants her out. He's picking up money on the ground. And I'm like, Bobby, what are you doing? Because I pick up loose change. The fights in here are better out there. We take the camera with her. The real action is right here. Like, Bobby, come on, man. Oh, I, you oh know, yeah, great stuff. Bobby, Bobby's, Bobby's great. stuff Love is Bobby. on camera. It's hysterical. I, I remember they were uh, having a thing in TNA with uh, uh, Jay Rick Rude, Richard, or uh, Bobby Rude, rather. Bobby and Bobby Roode yeah. is trying to find a new man up there. You know, open up Canada. the door to limo and they got Bobby the brain in and sits down. I was like, hey, here's some uh, some real estate props I own and uh, <laughs> you know, here's some other pamphlets and uh, you know, here's two tickets to dinner for, for you and your wife. Oh, I'm not married, Mr. Heenan. In that case, uh, here, you owe me 20 bucks next time. <laughs> <laughs> he, was one, he was one of my first original picks to be my manager. It was him and Sherry Martell. So, uh, so let, me, let me ask you this then, how, who, who had the idea to pair you up with Symphony and, and how were, what was your kind of reaction to that, like, okay, now what? Well, Bobby almost had the deal, he wanted to do it, but he was, he had him busy doing commentary at the time, Tony Schiavone, right? And Sherry almost had a gig, Sherry Martell, but they went ahead and went with, um, Alicia, Alicia, Webb, right? Alicia Webb, right, Alicia Webb. Yep, who, it just came out fresh off of New York, you know what I mean? Right, she had just done uh, Ken Shamrock's free time as, uh, with Ken Shamrock and Bell. So the office paired us together, which uh, you know it was pretty cool. I mean, she to this day a sweetheart, lady, really nice lady. So, but yeah, I mean that was cool. But yeah, those were my two original picks. At the time we were talking about Bobby Heenan and Sherry Martell. Yeah, it, I guess uh, either one. I mean, I, I was friends with either one, and it was like, God, please, you know. <laughs> Oh, great. yeah, we were great on the road with these guys. I'm sure the, the stories of Bobby Heenan could tell. Uh, but Alicia was wonderful. I mean, what a great lady she was. That's terrific. So, so tell me, uh, give me some of the territory. And yeah, excuse me, she's still a great that, lady. That you work for. <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, well, you, you've been around the block a bit, so. I mean, we talk about Smoky Mountain, USWA, uh, WWC out of Puerto Rico, uh, a few up in Canada, uh, Mexico, AAA. Uh, Europe, you know, the Japanese, oh God, you know, not, not just pro wrestling, <laughs> not just pro wrestling, but like MMA <laughs> right. and, and, and all that, and um, so you've, you've had your fun, traveled all over the world, you know, some world class, and you know, some, some AWA guys, you know what I mean, up this way, and, uh, in California. So what are you doing these days? Now that you're retired from the ring, you're still doing independent shots? Uh, I'm, I'm still active. I'm also doing acting for television and film. Um, I got a disc golf set for Good Behavior. that will be on TNT this, this new season this fall. Um, I was on Sleepy Hollow last year on Fox and Secrets and Lies on ABC. I got two movies coming out this year premiering. One called Son of Clowns. It's always making its array around the theaters. It's from festivals. And sonofclowns.com is this website. Check out the trailer and everything. Another one I did with uh, old WCW buddy Bill Goldberg, uh, William Forsythe, Kenny Johnson, Fred Williamson. All star cast is called Check. It's an action military film, and that'll be released, premiered, Memorial Day weekend. Outstanding. So, do you have a website or anything else you want to plug? Absolutely. Uh, my official website is thestro.com, T H E S T R O.com. Uh, Facebook, Stro the Maestro. And on Twitter at the Stro, Instagram at Stro Maestro, and also do uh, uh, weekly radio shows on VOCNation.com. Uh, in the room with Pete Pro Wrestling Illustrated, Grady Hicks, uh, every Tuesday, and Kathy Fitzpatrick. And Wednesdays I, I, I do a WCW Retro podcast where I just relive the old NWA, WCW memories, and just old great wrestling memories in general. So it's always a good time. Lots of great stuff there. Thank you very much for your time, Stro. It's very much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So that was our interview with the Stro. And Stro is such a great guy. His interview came uh, totally uh, un- where we, we just kind of walked into it. He happened to be available. I happened to be available. I said, hey, do you want to do this? He said, sure. And we, we just sat down. We had a great talk. 
Really great guy. Hope that we can hear more from Stro uh, with regard to Shadowfire promotions in the near future. Uh, and uh, kind of a note on some of the stuff that we talked about. If you see what he's doing now in wrestling, you look at what he's doing, the, the type of uh, gimmick he has, you look at the character, and I think that's probably a lot closer to his image of what he wanted the maestro to be. If you listen to the section where he talked about what his idea was for Maestro when World Championship Wrestling uh, proposed it to him. I think that what he's doing now is a lot closer to it. Uh, but great guy. So, I uh, hope that you enjoyed this. Uh, let's get a little bit of business done. If you're interested in subscribing to our podcast, uh, we're having some troubles right now with the iTunes store as of this date, which is the 1st of September. This is when I'm recording the the ending to this. Um, we did this interview about a year or two back, and I just had uh, life got in the way, and I got busy, um, and I just never got to uploading it. So now I'm doing it. Um, so I had a little bit of trouble with iTunes, but you can always go and subscribe to us on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Chicago. That's SFP, like Shadowfire Promotions, I-N-C, like Incorporated, and Chicago. Our Facebook is facebook.com slash Chicago. We hope you like our page. Uh, Twitter.com slash Chicago. Um, let's see what else is there. Well, like I say, we're currently having some issues with iTunes, switching over how we do things, so I don't want to give you that link yet. Uh, as I say, if you're interested in any questions regarding a podcast, anything, uh, if there's a particular wrestler or a fighter that you want interviewed, anything like that, questions, comments, anything at all, send that to us at podcast at sfpinkchicago.com um, That is also our website conveniently. I think I forgot to mention our website at sfpinkchicago.com We are hoping to have some sections up by the end of the year. Uh, we decided it was just a little too tough to try and get the whole site up at one shot because it would just take forever and it would just be a never-ending project because there's always new stuff coming in. It would just be impossible. So we're going to try and open it up a section at a time to kind of help facilitate, and we'll build up other sections as we get new merchandise in. We'll just kind of hold on to that and put it in as we build up and open up other sections. So, um, so that's about it for now. But like I say, if you have any questions about uh, Shadowfire Promotions distributing your merchandise, um, any questions regarding that, please uh, send us an email at distribution at sfpinkchicago.com. If you have any questions about ordering or selling us your merchandise, your pro wrestling or your mixed martial arts merchandise, drop us an email at orders at sfpinkchicago.com. But I do believe that is all for now, so we'll see you next time. Front row ringside.